Thanks again for coming, Sabrina Lebeau. I'm just going to give all one-word answers. <laughs> Be one of those interviews where you just die, yes. <laughs> Conservatory and Juilliard, right? You did it. I mean, I'm sorry, I went blank, sorry. Oh, I'm mixed up now. <laughs> Yale. <laughs> We're going to start Sabrina LeBeau. <laughs> sorry, I've been talking to everybody. Um, Yale. Well, I mean, my, my, my timeline as an actor started way before Yale. Um, I went to the Yale School of Drama. And I decided to go to the Yale School of Drama, even though I always wanted to go to NYU. And I wanted to go to NYU just out of pure ignorance. Um, <laughs> I grew up in Los Angeles, and I went to <coughs> inner city schools in Los Angeles. And um, the school that I went to in grammar school, I did my first play when I was in the second grade. It had a very strong theater program for some reason. And so when I got out of grammar school and I went to high school, in high school I did, like everybody else, I went to an all-girls Catholic high school, so I did all the school plays. And then when I ran out of plays to do at an all-girls school, I went to all-boys schools and did plays and did uh, community theater. And then when it was time for me to go to college, I had to go to UCLA. And the reason that I had to go to UCLA was because my stepmom had gone to UCLA and I was brainwashed from a very early age. Like from the age of six when I met her, she told me that I had to go to UCLA. And so I didn't go to UCLA because of the theater program. I went because my stepmother said I had to go to UCLA to carry on the tradition. So um, fortunate for me, when I got to UCLA, they did have a very strong theater program. And so I spent four years in a theater program, which at the time, so to tell my age, um, I graduated from high school in 1976. And when I went into theater, there were no people who looked like me. It was basically an all-white department, and there were about 13, uh, I would say, African-American and other actors. And we sort of branched off and had to do our own shows because we weren't cast. And we were sort of like this little branch outside of the main theater department. And um, so I sort of spent four years at UCLA not really being a part of the department. And so when it was time for me to graduate, the people who were in my class, people like Heather Locklear and Heather Thomas, I thought, well, they don't look like me. I don't look like that. How am I going to go into Hollywood and get a job? I'm probably not. So um, my acting teacher at the time at UCLA, she said, well, why don't you go to graduate school, study, and if you study in a conservatory, then you have at least a shot of working in the regional theater. So I applied to NYU, and the only reason I wanted to go to NYU because it was in New York City, and I figured if I was in New York City, some Broadway producer would come to NYU and see me and put me on Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it works. <laughs> accepted and uh, about three weeks later I got into the Yale School of Drama. Now bear in mind at the time that I um, auditioned for the Yale School of Drama, Meryl Streep had just won her first Academy Award and she had gone to the Yale School of Drama and I figured there's no way in hell I'm getting into the Yale School of Drama so that's why I'm going to NYU. And I got the acceptance letter to go to the Yale School of Drama. So I went to my acting teacher and I said, you know, I really want to go to NYU because Broadway's calling me. And, <laughs> and she said, you are such a dumbass. I mean, she basically said, if you don't go to the Yale School of Drama and all it has to offer, then I'm basically never going to speak to you again. So I went to the Yale School of Drama. And I would say from there, the rest is history. Because what the Yale School of Drama did under the direction and tutelage of Lloyd Richard was there were no color lines. Um, you just got cast. And you got cast a lot. And you got to do everything. 
And what it did was it gave you this enormous amount of confidence. Even if you couldn't act, you graduated with this enormous amount <laughs> that you would just go out and you would get a job. I mean, you would walk into these casting sessions and say, I'm here, you know, I can do this. And so I would say, if anything, that's what it, over training, that's what it gave us. It gave us an enormous amount of confidence. And you said when you left, what was it like when you left college? You said, or Yale, you said when you went to Juilliard, they had mass auditions and a different perspective. Well, what used to happen yeah. back in the day was um, if you had gone to Juilliard, NYU, Yale School of Drama, um, ACT, any of the professional training programs, then at the end of your tenure, you would go to this mass audition at Juilliard in New York City, and it would just be this audience filled with agents and casting directors because they, at the time, again, this is a totally different time than now. This is a time when People from the group theater were still teaching acting. Stella Adler and you know uh, Lee Strasberg and these are, and so there was a connectivity to theater history and theater and acting and theater. And the people who were coming out, like Marlon Brando and Dustin Hoffman and Al Pacino, you wanted to be those people. So there was this respect and respect for the craft, respect for training. And so when all of these people gathered, when casting directors at that time and um, agents at that time gathered, it was because they were coming to see the cream of the crop. They knew that these actors who were coming out were serious business, they were well trained, and that they would be reliable and you could put them in film and television and get the job done. So it was a different climate. And you said you auditioned them instead of them auditioning Basically, you. when you would finish this audition <laughs> session, you got to do two scenes, three, I actually did <laughs> three scenes, but that's because I had to play a dead person. But <laughs> <laughs> for Angela Bassett and Charles Dutton, it was their scene, and so I had to be a dead person. But um, yeah, when you finished the audition process, you went out into this hallway, and there were all these papers on the wall with all the agents who wanted to see you. And you would go to these meetings, and they would pitch why you should be represented by them. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, even saying it, that's crazy. It's crazy. That's amazing. And you, but you knew you were going to work, right? Because yeah. you went to Yale. Yeah, you had no, you had, there was no thought in your mind that you wouldn't have a job. Yeah. It's just like that today. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, nothing's changed. And I mean, you came from this history. I was surrounded by people who, you had three years of intensive, together, training, on stage, doing roles, discussion of theater, discussion of acting. I mean, you lived, you ate, you breathed it. And so, yeah, you just knew when you got out. And you didn't necessarily, Yale did not say, well, you want to go and be famous. It was almost like, who wants to be famous? You know, I want to go and I want to work in the theater because I'm a trained actor. So there was no thought of, I'm going to go out there and be famous and get my 15 minutes or any of that. No, I'm going to go and I'm going to work and I'm going to work in the regional theater. I'm going to work in the theater and I'm going to be good at it. Huh. So film wasn't even on the docket? No. Wow. Not interesting. Or television even? No. Wow. I guess that didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> that did not work out. <laughs> wow, <Well>, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry for me. Because <laughs> you prefer theater, yeah? Or is it, where, where is it's it? It's not that I prefer it, it's that I think that wherever you start, that's where you feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And so I was trained in the theater, and I was trained on the stage, so that's where I feel comfortable. There's no question, when I walk into a room the first day of rehearsal to pick up a script to do a play, I know what to do. And I feel comfortable there. Um, I don't feel as comfortable if I walk onto a television set or onto a film, because that's not what I know. Yeah, how is it different for you like, in terms of that structure or approach to the work? Um, completely. <laughs> uh, theater, I don't know. Uh, I don't understand completely the, the technical aspects of especially film. I do understand theater because, I mean, I understand television because having done television for eight and a half years, um, and it's very similar to theater because there are four cameras, there are sets, 
It's done in order. There's an audience. It's flat. It's a proscenium. And you interact with those people, and the camera follows you. You each have, there's four cameras, you each have a camera, and the camera follows you. And it's bigger because it's the same depth, it's, it's the same walls as theater. So there is a projection outward. And in, in film, I can't speak to it because I've done very little of it, but I never feel comfortable in it because it's a completely different medium. Hmm. Interesting. And what's, so after you left Yale, where did that go from there? Like what was that leading up to um, the show? From Yale, I moved to New York City. <laughs> because if you want to be a serious actor, you move to New York City. Because you want to be on Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> So I moved to New York City and started auditioning. And lucky for me, I was telling Richard the last time we met, the change in my life that I knew that I would be able to get a job acting was I went to the theater and sat down and watched the movie Flashdance. <laughs> and for the first time in my life, in a lead, in a major film, was a person who looked like me, which I had never seen. And I thought, oh my god, here's hope. And at the time that I was at Yale in my third year, um, the producers of Flashdance were trying to do Flashdance 2. <laughs> so they called me in. <laughs> and then at the same time, they were doing the Cotton Club. And they called me in for the Cotton Club. And uh, just from there, I sort of said, wow, there's, there's a place for me. There's a niche. And so I was able to just start doing small things off Broadway, doing small workshops, doing a little bit of, you know, a little bit of soap, days on soaps, music videos, um, auditioning, auditioning, getting to know casting directors, which is what you have to do, make um, connections with casting directors, relationships with casting directors, so that they like you and they keep calling <coughs> you in. And then eventually it came the point when they called me in to audition for the Cosby Show. Hmm. Which was actually, this is crazy, again, I was maybe a year out of Yale. Maybe a year. So that was my struggle, a year. <laughs> again, it gives you a chance. It's, it's kind of the same. It's the same, yeah. Um, actually, I, I didn't realize that, just to, before we step into that, what was it like to do soap operas? Because I know it's a totally different beast. I, I, only, I mean, I only went in as a day player, but it's difficult. I was friends with an actress by the name of Debbie Morgan, uh, who played Angie on All My Children for many, many years, and it's, God bless them. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard work, it's long days, it's no rehearsal, it's one day, it's, they're amazing. I don't know how they do what they do. They're amazing. Again, another discipline that I don't understand, but amazing actors. Now you're going to go watch Soap Reference and respect it, right? <laughs> <laughs> no? <laughs> and then um, from there came The Cosby Show. So what was that process like getting involved with that? How did that, how did that start? What was that first phone call? It was, uh, did you know you knew who Bill Cosby was, I'm guessing, at the time? I knew who Bill Cosby was. He was the devil pudding man. <laughs> <laughs> By the time I got, here's the difference, I'm going to be fast forward. By the time I got out of the Cosby show and I moved to Hollywood to pursue acting in Hollywood, you would first be called in. Well, I didn't have to be called in at that point for a casting director because people knew who I was. So I'd be called into a room full of producers and directors and writers and I would audition for them. And then they would call me back, and then they would say, well, you have to come in now for the studio. Because at that point, the studios came in. Um, 20th Century Fox, who, whoever it is, Paramount. So then you had to audition for a group of studio executives. After that, then you had to go to the network. So at that point, the last step is you're walking in NBC, CBS, CBS, again, a room full of people. So along the way, you've got all these people who can get in the way of you getting a job. There are all these people that you have to please. So that's only nine years later. Back pedal to 1984, auditioning for The Cosby Show, I get a call, I take a subway out to Brooklyn, walk into the studio, walk into a room, here's the producer, here's the writer, here's Mr. Cosby, 
and they introduced me to all of them. I say, you don't have to introduce me to him. I know him. I said, I love you. And he said, she's got the job already. <laughs> <laughs> and I auditioned, and I swear to you, by the time I took the subway back to my house, I had had a call that I got the job. And that is the power of Bill Cosby. That is the power of a person in the industry who was so well respected, who no one ever came into the studio. There was no studio, there was no network, there were no people. It was us. It was us doing the work, no one ever intervened, no one ever bothered us. There was no television by committee. There were no other opinions. His opinion, the director's opinion, the producers, that's all that mattered. We stayed in that little bubble for eight years and did what we did, and no one messed with us. <laughs> Again, nothing's really changed. <laughs> and through the longevity of that process, what was it? What was it like? I guess even as you described it, um, I've never worked on that, that type of show. It's it's like you, the set itself and the process, but the filming process, but then the relationship process with. Um, Mr. Cosby and the rest of the cast, like what was what was that like on scene, behind the scenes, and you know, I'm guessing, and was Bill essentially in charge? Was that, what was the structure like throughout the day? Yeah, Mr. Cosby had final say on everything. I mean, he was a person that you went through. I would say he surrounded himself with people that he respected. Um, Jay Sandridge, who was our director, he surrounded himself with producers that he respected. He surrounded himself with actors that were very similar to actors to, to his family and to people that he had respect for. And so um, it was a very hard, intense, hard working, like going to work and producing something that he could be proud of, that we could be proud of, that they could all be proud of. And it was that simple. You know, it was like, go in on Monday, read the script, go home. Go in on Tuesday, read the rewrites, rehearse, go home. Go in on Wednesday, read the rewrites, go to camera blocking, Thursday, film, done. And there's a live audience there for you? Yeah. Okay. Two live audiences on Thursday. Okay. How many people? Um, it was a big studio, so it was like going into a big theater. So I would say probably, you know, four or five hundred people. Wow. In two different sets of four to five hundred people. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And and that was free, right? It was free. Okay. <laughs> wow. And were you guys all close on set, or what was the relationship like on offset regarding the family itself? Um, I would say that probably the people who were closer in age, the kids were closer in age, so they were closer to each other. I was probably closer to Felicia, my mom, because we were closer in age. We're probably less. We're about a decade apart. So um, I was probably closer to her, and also just because she had a very strong theater background, so we spoke the same language. Huh. Interesting. <laughs> and so, so you guys essentially were, were close, but only in the context of, of your work. Like, not so much outside of that. It's just like, but you, when you were, you were an incredible ensemble on set, and then outside of that, it's like you came in, you did that, you worked together, and then you left, essentially. That is correct. Huh. <laughs> How interesting. <laughs> so after, and then after eight years, nine I mean, I think people who are here who are actors, I mean, you go in and you do a show with people. I mean, think of the casts that you've been in. If you have a resume of 50 plays that you've done, how many of those people are you still close to? How many of those people can, if you ran to them on the street, can you remember their name? <laughs> you know, so it's the same. It's, for me, it was the, it was the same thing. It was you know we went in, we did the work, we we did it, and then it was over, and then we move on to the next thing. Yeah, yeah. You're the Cosby's. <laughs> <I mean, laughs> well, that's something that Tempest will always say when you get all of us together, <laughs> as Tracy will attest to. When you get all of us together, it's an interesting evening. You have um, very, very, very intelligent, very outspoken, very strong-willed, and very opinionated people. <laughs> <laughs> it's who these kids grew up to be, who these adults now are. Through the tutelage, obviously, the early tutelage of someone who is also <laughs> a big personality, who's very opinionated, who has very strong opinions, and they aren't afraid to share them. 
So, yeah, getting us all together <laughs> is, is an interesting new name. <laughs> And what yes, is, and Tracy will attend, and a long one. <laughs> is, um, and how do you feel like that's, has that changed the uh, structure entertainment-wise within um, the dynamics of race of, you know, with African Americans in, uh, in theater, in film, in television? Because it seemed like that was a long, like you're saying, because I, I didn't realize that you'd seen Flashdance and suddenly had an epiphany, but then to think, that was right after that. So obviously that was a time when I really was I wasn't really aware I was still you know. <laughs> You're just all diapers. Well, <laughs> <laughs> trying to keep that in the DL a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean I would say definitely it's changed now. I mean you could just look at you can look at the landscape of television now and, and just see that it, it's a completely different story now in terms of what kinds of parts there are, what kinds of roles. It's much more open. Yeah, definitely. And what did you, did, were you guys aware of that at the time? Like, this is changing Yes, history. definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the thing that you also have, and I'm not going to call it a burden, but you have the responsibility. It was more than, obviously, just doing a television show. You had the responsibility on your shoulders of a race of people. <laughs> 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 To, to so many people, and it changed so many people's lives. I mean, I still have people who come to me and cry because they tell me how much it meant to them and how much it changed their lives. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> most jobs you don't have, most television jobs you don't have that kind of responsibility. That was a responsibility that we were carrying, yeah. Wow, it's no pressure every day. No pressure. <laughs> Wow, that's exciting. I mean, I was telling the story of when we decided to do, well, when Mr. Cosby decided to do an episode where I would have kids, and um, he would not tell anyone who, what the names were. He didn't tell the director, he didn't tell the writers, he didn't tell the network. He told me privately in his dressing room, and he says, the first time anyone will hear those names is when I ask you, and it was sort of, it wasn't a scene that was written, he says, I'm not going to have them write the scene, we're just going to have this conversation. So, scene came, I'm in the hospital bed, he comes to me, he says, I saw the babies, blah, 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 and I go to say, uh, uh, did you see their names, and he says, yes, Woody and Nelson, and at that time, in the climate that we were in, you did not say those names. You did not say Winnie Mandela or Nelson Mandela. You just did not. And so we said it. <laughs> and there it was for the world. And it was sort of our country saying, this is what we believe. And as black people in America, this is what we believe. And this is what you know we, we look up to. This is what we want. Well. <laughs> I had no idea. That's amazing. No, we had a person on staff. I mean, this is pretty famous. People know this. We had a person on staff who would sit with Mr. Cosby and look over the scripts and say if there were any sort of stereotypes that could be misconstrued by an audience. Mm -hmm. Say, for instance, Keisha's getting her hair, Rudy's getting her hair combed, and she goes, ouch. That signifies that she has nappy hair. He would take out the gouge. I mean, the smallest things like that. I mean, it wasn't just the artwork that was on the walls or the music that was played subliminally or the names that came out of his mouth or the things that we did. It was the simplest of gestures that in this country stood for something else. Huh. And was he, I'm assuming, he was aware of that going into the idea of the production itself? Yes. Like, that's the intent of this show? Yes. Wow. He, he had, he was on a mission. <laughs> huh. What a great job. Mission from God. Yeah, and, and you, you said, I just thought this was really interesting, um, about your relation, everybody's relationship with him on set, and what that was like. Um, about him, I'll let you speak to that, but it was just, it just, it's such a great story of how it was. Well, I mean, it's just very respectful. You know? You have to be. And it also, he is the same age as my father. And there is something, and African Americans can speak to this, that there's just this kind of old school respect for your elders. 
And so those people are called Mr. In his case, Doctor. You know, you just you don't act up. You don't show your color in public. I mean, you don't act mm -hmm. up. And so there was, a, yeah, just a huge amount of respect for this, for this, you know, artist, for this person. Yeah, and always wanting to make him proud at yeah. each show. Right. That's amazing. Exactly. You don't want to disappoint. Mm -hmm. It's that thing of like my dad. All he has to do is look at you the wrong way. You <laughs> don't want to disappoint him. Mm -hmm. It's not fear. It's not the anger that you're afraid of. You don't want the look of he's disappointed in me. Was there any highlight within the process of doing the show for you personally, just in any capacity, as an artist, as an individual, in terms of understanding the capacity of what you were doing? No, no, yeah. because I mean, I think that it was my first big job out of school and I just wanted to do a good job, you know? And so I, I think a lot of times we didn't realize, even though we knew we had a responsibility, we didn't realize that it wasn't as big as it was. You know, we weren't walking, walking around going, hey, you look, God, be sure. No, I mean, it was just, <laughs> we were just going to do a job and to do a job well. And um, that was it. Huh. <laughs> so, and what happened after that finished? And why did it end? Like, what was he the... He made the decision to end it. Okay. Any yeah. reason in particular or just time for No, something? he was just, you run out of storylines. It's, I mean, it's hard. You watch Grey's Anatomy? No. It's <laughs> <laughs> Do you still work there? Do you still? Yes. You, 
When was the last time you worked and did a production, production there? I did. Um, they have something called a free for all, and um, they remount plays from the regular season free for audiences that can't afford to come to the plays. And the last show I did was the taping of the shirt at the free for all. Okay. Mm -hmm. And is that the one? Because you mentioned that you went over to England. Uh, oh, which is before the... that, yeah. No, uh, we did a production of Love's Labor's Lost. Um, which we took to uh, the, Sha the Royal Shakespeare Company in England uh, did the Complete Works Festival where they did every word of Shakespeare, <laughs> every word ever written of Shakespeare. And they invited all of these companies uh, from around the world with their companies. And they just asked Michael that he bring something very American. So, uh, <laughs> so he took us, it was a production that we had already done, we had done it in the regular season, we had done it at the Free For All, and then we remounted it for the Complete Works Festival at the Royal Shakespeare Company. And I would say that's probably the highlight of my life. <laughs> I mean, what that means to an actor to be at the Royal Shakespeare Company, that is, I think I'm happy now. <laughs> <laughs> and you had a great story about the King Lear, the company that did all of the works in a row, which I, blows my mind. I think that it was even not much possible, but the quality and what you said about being at lunch with him. So I just think it's one of the best stories I've ever heard. Um, While we were there, the, the <laughs> core company there of the RSC, they were trying to do all of the history plays in order with the same company with the same 35 actors. And they would do a show Thursday evening, Friday morning, Friday afternoon, Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, and they just did them in order. It was, changed my life. It was astounding. It was just astounding. I mean, I've never seen anything like that. And the thing is, the current artistic director there, he believes, and here we go speaking to today, he believes that theater has to get rid of its preconceived ideas of what theater is, and it's got to get rid of the flat proscenium, and it's got to get rid of the audience there, us here. He says because everything is interactive, because of reality television, because of MTV, because of short attention spans, that the theater has to surround you and that people have to be, the actors have to be there with you, and you have to be in it and feel it. And this was like circus away. This was, <laughs> it was crazy. This was, this was people coming in on raptors and being shot in midair and swinging and falling and blood and guts. And <laughs> it was, it was spectacular. It was just spectacular. So I guess when you say in the round, it doesn't quite do justice <laughs> to what that is. So was the audience actually? They were just everywhere. They came in off of, they just came in off of balconies. They would talk to you. They were there with you. It was spectacular. Wow. Yeah. That's right. You were saying, sorry, it was classic. And you saw the man who played King Lear at lunch. Well, no, well, no, this was, yeah, this was one of the Henrys. Oh, okay. and yeah, and, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> and yeah, he was sitting at lunch, and I had seen him like gone on this journey with him and watched these shows. And I was sitting at lunch in this restaurant, and I thought, I just, I can't. You know, I wanted to go up, I wanted to be a fan, and just say, oh my god. But I, I couldn't. I was like, I can't bother him because I know he's got two more shows. He's done a show. He's done an afternoon show. So I just kind of like sat there and just, I'm sure he thought, who's that crazy boy? <laughs> yeah, I was just sort of just looking at him from afar, but I never went up to him. So, so this is private time. He's got to go back out there and, and do this again. Mm -hmm. So now you know what it feels like to be on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> I would say the closest thing that I saw at the Shakespeare Theater that did that was they brought in a production from, um, did that come in from the Guthrie? Did the King Lear with Stacey Keach come in from the Guthrie? Yeah, I think so. It was. Brilliant. Just brilliant. And it was the same thing. It was kind of this gritty. Like you could see people just being uncomfortable and people getting up and leaving. And, but it was, you did not go to sleep because <laughs> the music was loud and it was raunchy and raw. And Stacy was raw and Edgerow, everything was just raw and ugly. And, but it just, 
pulled you in. And that, again, was that experience of when you have that, when it just pulls you in and it changes your life, that, yeah, <laughs> there's nothing like it. <laughs> wow. And what is that? I mean, what is that for you in terms of from someone of your caliber, you know, with your training and experience? <laughs> well, I mean, it's a lot. <laughs> I don't mean to poo-poo. No, I mean that respectfully in the sense that I, it's not many people that get the opportunity to not only study at that caliber institution, but then to also, I mean, who doesn't work after a year, but on a nine-year show <laughs> that changes the world. <laughs> I mean, but it's, it's a unique opportunity, and then to work with that caliber Shakespeare on top of that, it's just, there, there's such pinnacles within the structure of acting um, in the in the world of, of theatrical entertainment and film and television. So what is that, I guess from your perspective, to see that, you know, to see those actors, to see that work, um, what is that for you? I guess, what, and what, why does that tap you so much more than anything else that you, you said, like, why is that such a highlight, that moment? Hard question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that's why I sort of make fun of what you said when you caliber of actor, because in the end, I don't think of myself as a good actor, which is the bottom line. And when I go to something and I see something that I look and I go, I can't do that. And I know I can't do that, or at least I feel I can't do that. And when they make me just transform and take me to another place and sit there in awe and my mouth is dropped open and I'm salivating. That is, if you remember it forever, it changes your life forever. It's amazing. <laughs> and it's, it's unfortunately, the only downside is that with that theater is that you can't necessarily, you can't revisit that experience again. It's kind of lost in time whereas a film can be seen again. Um, unique to itself, you know what I mean? Even to get the same ensemble again. It's such a unique thing to have that ensemble again together, you know, with where they're at and the roles they play. It's just, it's, and I think that's one of the things that makes it special um, in its own entity. But I mean, all the, all the veins are so special in so many distinct ways that make them extraordinary. But um, and I'm just jealous, basically, is what I'm saying. <laughs> I really want to say that. <laughs> um, that's amazing. Um, yeah, I think we'll open up to the audience. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. definitely. So, do you, yeah, we just want to open the forum up to the audience. Any questions? Sure. Where is where is Alvin? <laughs> <laughs> Jeffrey Owens, here's the crazy thing. Jeffrey <coughs> Owens went to Yale undergrad at the same time I was at Yale grad. I did not know him uh, at the time. So, um, he by far, I mean, he's, he's so talented and so funny and really creative. And so, I mean, he's out there like everybody else, struggling. I mean, I think he's a very unique and specific kind of actor, but he's just, Mr. Cosby loved him. He's so terrific. I mean, he really changed the storyline because when the show started, I had a different boyfriend, and the way the script was written, I was supposed to end up with the good-looking guy that they brought in, and Jeffrey came in and just floored everybody. I mean, he was funny, he was, mm -hmm. and that, that shows you as an actor the power that you have if you can walk in a room and change the perspective of the writers, the producers, and everything, the casting directors that they thought they were going to do, and then they write a character for you because you're so good. And that's, that's his story. That's how he ended up on the show. He was just supposed to come in for a second, do one show, be gone. <coughs> Not going down that easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the Graduate was a similar experience. The Graduate of the film, Dustin Hoffman, who was originally cast as a uh, Ivy League football player looking kind of guy and then they saw Dustin <laughs> and blew them away and they totally changed the script, you know, in terms of the, con right, the concept right. of where it's going. Unique opportunity, but that's when that happens, it's, it's impressive to say the least. Right. Yeah, wow. Um, yeah, anyone else? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any uh, favorite story or memory from the Cosby show um, that really sticks out in mind? I was telling Richard, not really. 
I mean, because A was a very, very, very long time ago. And um, again, for me, it was, it was just, I know this sounds terrible, it was a job and it was about doing the job to the best of my ability and sort of went in, did it, you know, went home. So, I mean, as an overall experience, yes, I'm very proud to say that that is, that was a part of my life. I'm proud of it. It's a great legacy. But I don't have like any anecdotes or any, any insider information. <laughs> <laughs> Will there be a reunion? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just, you got the script and that was where you began? Or was there any input? Um, we always began with at least an outline or some sort of, a, you know, a storyline, some piece of a script. And then if in the rehearsal process, as in any rehearsal process of a new play or new script, um, it would be changed to fit whatever worked best. You know, it was, it was an evolving, it was evolving. And, and how involved was he? The, the, Completely. It was very, it was him. Completely. It was very him, so. All his stories. Was he, was he like he the head writer? He would have a meeting where he would sit and say, I have a story I think of the, like, because he okay. speaks, if you know anything about Mr. Cosby, he speaks in these very abstract terms, ideas, the light, and then there was the thing on the <laughs> ceiling as I was walking out the door, and that light over there with the camera was, <laughs> can you write that? <laughs> While you're doing it, that chair might be good too in that box. <laughs> <laughs> it's, very, it's a it's a language all its own. <laughs> but you can do it. It's good. <laughs> uh, what was your training in undergrad and in grad school? Uh, well, in the theater, program? yeah, at UCLA it was a general theater program mm -hmm. because the program believed that if you understood the way theater worked, then it would make you better and appreciative of your particular discipline. So you had to take everything, stage management, lighting, directing, set design, costume design, and so just in general overall, so that if you had to be in each of those disciplines, then maybe you as an actor when you went on stage wouldn't be so upset at the stage manager. You would have an appreciation for what it is that they do. <laughs> and so in, 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 at UCLA, it was general. Mm -hmm. And then at Yale, it's specifically, it's a master's degree in acting. So it's just three years of intensive acting training, acting program. And who would have been the main focal point of that training? Uh, what, from what school? Of well, the schools, the schools now, I don't know where they are and what they do because schools are... Professional training programs are determined by obviously the staff, the board, the artistic directors. At the time that I went to Yale, um, it was divided into three years of training, the first year being all realism, so mainly the works of uh, Chekhov and Ibsen, a whole year, and a little bit of Strindberg. Second year was all verse, and then third year was contemporary. And they had a very strong emphasis. There was no school because John Turturro was in my cast and in my cast in my class, and he had come from the neighborhood playhouse. Charles Dutton had come out of prison. You know. <laughs> Angela Bassett had come out of Yale undergrad. You know, so you had all these different types. They didn't want to mold you into something. All they wanted was performance, performance, performance. So you were cast constantly. And if when they went to see those shows, they saw a problem, then they would address it. They didn't care how you got to the result as long as you were successful at it. I mean, I remember doing scenes from Ibsen in class with John Turturro, like doing repeat exercise from the neighborhood playhouse. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, can't we just move forward to the next line? I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? 
<laughs> yeah. And then when I got out of Yale, because here's the thing, that Yale did not really care again. They didn't care about giving you a, a method or a set of, a way to get to the emotion. Just whatever you use would work for you. So when I got out, I kind of felt cheated. So I decided when I moved to New York that I would go first to Lee Strasberg. I lasted a day. Because <laughs> I thought, why are they sitting over there in the corner <laughs> doing a sense of memory with an egg <laughs> when they're six years old and they're sitting on a toilet? What does that have to do with doing a production? You know, Because Yale, they were very production-oriented. So how do you get from that <laughs> to doing a whole production? So yeah, it lasted like a day. And so then I sought out Bobby Lewis and uh, another, another acting teacher out of the tradition of um, the group theater. And uh, very simpatico. He was very much scene oriented, interaction oriented, people talking to people, not sitting in the corner crying. And I'm so, I'm so terrible, I'm sorry. It works for a lot of people. So I studied with him, but I did that because I felt that I had been cheated out of those experiences. Those experiences that people talked about at, these, at the actor studio at all these places, and I wanted to have those experiences as well. Yeah, it's, it's different because when you go, it's grad school. So when you go into that master's program, most people have a foundation of some sort. I mean, that's how they come from the neighborhood, they come from Strasbourg, they come from it. Yeah, so, and that sort of focus wasn't, you know, typically when you get to that point, isn't so much on redefining that as it is as the word that seems. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, because I took an undergrad that was general too, and I thought, oh, I really understand all this stuff. I don't even know how to do that. Like, I had no idea how to get there, though. Like, I didn't feel like I was grounded in any structure um, until later. But what so. that does do is it gives you an appreciation later on when you are doing a play, mm -hmm. and it's a 10 out of 12, and you're on there, and they're focusing lights, and you're tired, and the director's yelling and screaming. It gives you an appreciation for their point of view. Mm -hmm. And Because like at UCLA, I did a lot of directing. And doing a lot of directing, <coughs> I realized I couldn't be a director. Because, I, I understand them, because you tell an actor to stand right there. Just stand there and sit on that line, and then you don't. <laughs> You're on the stage, you get to do whatever you want. So tonight, I don't feel like standing and sitting there. I'm going to three inches to the left and, and pick up that thing on this line. And then you wonder why they're yelling and screaming. And it's because I understand, because I was that person, like sitting there going, why is he doing that? Why is he doing that? <laughs> <laughs> he can stop doing that. I didn't tell him to do that. I understand that because of the training that you Because I've been that person. I always tell that story with Michael Kahn, one of the first shows I ever did. And I was in a rehearsal, and he's like, you know, five feet away from you. And he's looking, and he turns to his assistant. I'm talking, 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 talking. Because I always had these characters that talk a lot. And he's sitting there, and he's going, why is she doing that? He's not even looking at me. He's like, why is she doing that? <laughs> Who told her to do that? And I stopped, and I said, you know, Michael, you're making me afraid to say anything. And he said, well, you should be. <laughs> and I said, then I understand. In those moments, you go, OK, I understand. <laughs> That's fantastic. I mean, I don't take it personally. You're all trying to get the same result. You're all trying to, you're there together, trying to. Yeah, and you're able to work, I, I find anyway, more as an ensemble when you understand not only respect for them, but where the other pieces fit in. And I feel like actors can contribute more, just as text can contribute more if they understand the other element to create that ensemble. Right. So that's usually easier product, faster product, stronger product. And I was telling Richard, the last time that I just remembered, the other thing was um, when I first started working for him, he said to me one day, he says, who was your, your um, first teacher at Yale? And I told him the name, and he said, huh, and you're still good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, one more. Um, uh, me? Oh, yes. You're right. <laughs> 
<laughs> Can you um, say a little more about like um, where you are now? I've, somebody said maybe North Carolina, <coughs> how you got here, and then the work you're doing right now. How I got to North Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the work you're doing. Too. I have lived off and on in Yale for about three, I mean, off and on in New York um, for three different times in my life. And um, as I grew older, it was not a place that I felt like living anymore. It was just fast and aggressive. And, and so I thought, well, I want to go someplace that's, you know, nice. And someplace that's quiet and where people are friendly. <laughs> started sort of just looking at places and Asheville came up, it was in the national consciousness, it was on the front page of you know the New York Times travel and I thought, well that sounds like a neat place, I'll go and try it there. And the thing that happens when you grew up in Los Angeles and you lived in New York, Los Angeles and New York, their mentality is that's it. Well, all that stuff in the middle, it doesn't exist, I don't know who those people are, I don't know why they live there. <laughs> And so I moved here. Are you in Asheville? I'm in Asheville. I am. Yeah, I live here in Asheville. <laughs> how hard you're trying. This is what I said to the tax preparer because she had never done an actor's taxes before. <laughs> you can tell how hard you're trying by the money that you make, how much of it goes back into your career. So those people, because this again, this is a new age. The way to be an actor now is completely different. So unless you've got your Twitter and your website and your, you know, and you're spending, getting, and out there, and visiting, and you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a bitter struggle now. So unless all that money is going back into that, then you're not really trying. And if you look at my income as opposed to what are my deductibles, I'm not really trying. <laughs> 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 and this day and age with reality TV and with the way the industry is, you've got to be really trying. And you've got to be in it to win it. Otherwise, then you just have to change your focus. And my focus is, is is not that anymore. It sounds a lot like why maybe a lot of us moved here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> People are nice. And it's like, yeah, there's a contentment here, I think. But uh, when I first moved here, I, I was doing art. And I noticed, like, some of the art maybe isn't as edgy as I, It was just Atlanta where I lived. But there's this edginess to the art sometimes in bigger cities. And here it just feels like... Why do people paint mountains? That's so boring. You can't handle that. And then, like, I remember when I first painted a mountain, and I was like, no, but then I'm like, but I'm happy, you know. <laughs> and it can be scary because everyone, your identity, what happens with artists is your identity is that I'm an actor and I'm only as good as, as acting, and if I'm acting, and when's the last time I acted? My thing is, after the Cosby show ended, I went back to school for interior design. So acting has never been, even though it sounds like I spent a lot of time acting, acting has never been my major focus. Um, I have always wanted to be all these other things and do all these other things. So I identify with whatever it is that I'm doing at the moment. That's what, that's what I say that I am. And so what my friends could understand and my agents could understand is, how could you? How could you turn your back on this? What are you going to do? You know? Suddenly you're going to be nobody. How, how, you know? And so people don't understand that. It's, it's very difficult. And for actors, it's very difficult to say, like in your head, I'm not going to actively be in Los Angeles and New York and do this. I'm going to go away and just be, you know, take care of myself. What do you think about the decor here? I love it. <laughs> Why? I know. <laughs> because you study. 
interior design. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I like it. And it actually shows well on the web page. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like when you go to the web page, you go, I want to go to that school. <laughs> Things are happening there. You can tell. I'll pay you after. Okay. <laughs> One more. Um, what do you think about the production going on now in North Carolina? Homeland has, uh, their success has set up such a huge infrastructure for <coughs> in Charlotte and also in uh, Wilmington. There's Revolution, Iron Man 3 was filmed there. I think North Carolina is only fourth now behind New York, LA, and New Orleans in terms of film production. And have you had any, does your agent say, why don't you go talk to the people on Homeland? That's a, that's a great show. Have you no. been pushing that? Well, I crazy again because New York LA mentality I discovered like a year ago that there are agents in Atlanta hello <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I signed as an agent in Atlanta and yeah they represent everything they represent Homeland Army Wives all the Tyler Perry stuff they interface with production in Florida in New Orleans with Treme with all of that it's moving and a shaken it is hardcore down here in Georgia there's so much production it bottles the mind HGTV all mm -hmm. of that stuff is here so I was in um, uh, an episode uh, three of season one of in, in home mm -hmm. and I just was uh, on a weekend shoot for revolution mm -hmm. And the sheer number of talented mm -hmm. crew people. Mm -hmm. um, I just auditioned for a Hallmark movie in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. And I think the only reason they're gonna, they can do that in Charlotte is because of the entire infrastructure of Homeland, which is not shooting right now. Right. You have all of this talent. Right. The lighting, the sound, the sets, everything. Exactly. And it just seems like that there's more and more of that going on now. There is, the I agree. I mean, I was stupid. I was really ignorant until I got these agents on the phone and they started telling me the amount of production down here. I it's was, huge. I was shocked. And know. Iron Man 3 was done in Wilmington because the Republican governor of Michigan wouldn't give him a tax break. <laughs> they were going to Michigan and they went to Wilmington. So good for all the actors who live in these parts. <laughs> good for you.